right, I'm going to get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Prologue for Dial and for Murder. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this Early Curtain Tuesday. Um, the production you're seeing tonight was adapted by Jeffrey Hatcher from the original script by Frederick Knott. And this production was directed by Rachel Alderman. My name is Olivia Spinard. I work in education here. Um, and I'm also the understudy for the production, uh, so welcome. Dial M for Murder was originally written for the stage by Frederick Knott in 1952, and it was made into a television movie for Saturday Night Theater on the BBC. That's actually because, despite Knott's attempts to get the play produced, no one really liked it. They didn't think it would make money. Um, and there's a great quote from his wife, actually, I believe it was from his obituary, where she said, not only wrote for money, <laughs> my husband only wrote for money. So he actually only wrote three plays, and this is one of them. But eventually someone produced it after the success on Saturday Night Theatre, and it premiered on the West End in London, before heading over to the United States, where it did run on Broadway. Alfred Hitchcock then directed the film adaptation in 1954, and he worked very closely with Knott on the screenplay, which is nearly identical to the original stage text. There's more about the history of the original play in your program in the article Money, Sex, and Murder, A Murder Mystery Revisited by Fiona Kyle, the dramaturg. For those of you who were here at Jiva in our 2006-2007 season, we produced the original not version of Dial M that season. That original script became a mainstay in theaters across the country, from larger regional theaters like Jiva to small community theaters. Jeffrey Hatcher's new adaptation has taken the country by storm and looks like it might just become as much of, if not more, of a mainstay in the theater as the original. For those of you who are familiar with the original play or Hitchcock's movie, and for those of you who aren't, let's take a look at some more details of what makes this version different and why it's the fifth most produced show of the 2023-2024 season, according to American Theatre Magazine. So, Jeffrey Hatcher, the adapting playwright, has stayed very close to the plot points set up in the original text, but his adaptation has really focused on those plot points, rather than giving us extraneous detail. Or, to use a term from Hitchcock, Hatcher has removed the MacGuffins, otherwise known as Mr. X. In the original script by Frederick Knott, Captain Lesget, a villainous thug you'll meet, is very big into dog racing, and Tony Wendis takes up the hobby as well. While that's sort of an interesting, fun fact, Hatcher found it didn't really forward the plot. It didn't really drive momentum. He focused on retaining elements from the original that kept that momentum going and the audience on the edge of their seat as they watched the characters try to solve the mystery. One of the major differences between Knott and Hatcher's versions is with the character of Tony Wendis. In Knott's version, he's a former tennis player. In Hatcher's, Tony is a former writer. This ties a lot of different elements together in the show you're about to see. Firstly, it helps Hatcher's adaptation focus on the class and financial elements present within the story. Tony's wife, Margot, is an heiress who's inherited a large amount of money whereas Tony is from a middle-class background. Tony, being a writer, and perhaps not the most successful one, grows accustomed to being surrounded by wealth once he marries Margot, versus being a, fan, a famous tennis player who may have already been accustomed to the finer things. Another large change from the original is that Hatcher took the character of Max Halliday and changed it to Maxine Hadley, a successful writer of thrillers. Tony being a writer in Hatcher's version works really well here. He's given up on his dream of being a serious writer, whereas his friend Maxine is about to embark on a big publicity book for what is to be a hugely successful novel of hers, Your Death is Necessary. This sets up Tony and Maxine as really juicy foils to one another, and it begs the question about how Tony feels about Maxine's success and about Maxine herself. The change from Max to Maxine is also brilliant for our contemporary lens. In the original, the story follows men as they attempt to unravel the mystery, with Margot, played by Grace Kelly, almost feeling like a chess piece that they get to move around. 
Max in the original is smart and he's a mystery writer, but he isn't at quite the same level as Tony or Inspector Hubbard. Maxine, however, is a sleuth of her own right, who uses her writerly obsessions to help solve the mystery before it's too late. Maxine is actually based off of the writer Patricia Highsmith, who wrote The Price of Salt, which was made into the movie Carol, and the brilliant thriller novel, very famous, anyone want to take a guess? The Talented Mr. Ripley. Apparently Highsmith left many broken-hearted women in her wake. <laughs> the shift from Max to Maxine also impacts Margot in terms of her relationship to Maxine, and it gives Margot a lot more agency. While she isn't a sleuth to the same degree as Maxine or a mastermind like her husband Tony, Margot intuits a lot more than anyone realizes. And while Grace Kelly in the movie is beautiful and talented, that character she plays is more a victim of circumstance than the Margot we'll see tonight who takes matters into her own hands and learns her strength as she goes. Both Maxine and Margot fall more into the femme fatale trope from film noir in this version than in the original. Maxine is shrouded in mystery, and Margot's seductive quality is much more prominent. Hatcher's dialogue in this new adaptation elevates the original brilliant plotting. In particular, the first scene between Margot and Maxine hits all of the same points in both versions, but Hatcher's dialogue is concise, sleek, and dare I say a little sexy, while retaining the attitudes and values of the era. As concise as the dialogue is, Hatcher is genius at imbuing each line with character development that is rich and complex. Every line in this play has a sort of subtextual second meaning. Moral ambiguity is a common theme in film noir, and it's very much at play on the stage tonight with every single character. Now let's talk a bit about the production. So this is a co-production with Dallas Theater Center. Jeeva has been recently involved in several of these in the past few years, so you might have heard this term. A co-pro, as we like to call it, is when two theaters, maybe in very different parts of the country, team up on a show and share creative decisions, as well as financial resources. It benefits both theaters in innumerable ways and helps the company of actors and creative team forge strong bonds with each other as they continue to uncover more about the play and their characters in tandem across the country. It also means that the story you're seeing here is shared with other audiences in a totally different place. The creative team was led by director Rachel Alderman, who is the current Associate Artistic Director at the Long Wharf Theater in New Haven, Connecticut, and who is known for her fierce championship of artistic collaboration. The co-scenic designers are Christopher and Justin Swader, who are identical twins, called the Swader Brothers by everyone, and they really do seem to share one mind. They've worked at Dallas Theater in the past and I heard many of you commenting on the beauty of this set. We're so thrilled to have their work here on stage. A fun thing to note about their design is how they, along with Rachel, the director, determined that the flat, the apartment, was Margot's influence. It's in Chelsea, which is one of London's poshest and most affluent neighborhoods. It's filled with old money, with the older molding and all of the gorgeous touches and the statues. But then the furniture represents Tony's influence and taste which is much more mid-century modern and fresh. Notice the green of the couch or the lavender of the chair, which feels less antique. So they sort of bring in that oppositional factor into the set itself. The set also, if you noticed, has a forced perspective that might look a little off right now, but that's deliberate. You can see the slanting of the windows and the sort of tilting of the archways. Every character in this play is looking to find their footing and things are constantly off kilter. The Swaders Brothers' design was influenced by having seen this film in 3D, and they wanted our audiences to have a similar feeling as they did when they were watching, where nothing is quite as it seems. Our lighting designer's work will be familiar to you if you joined us for last season's Jane Eyre. Emma Dean is back with her moving lighting that owes a lot to the film noirs every time this word befuddles me. Chiaroscuro, if anyone wants to correct me, please shout it out. Chiaros Chiaroscuro, I've, not, I've Googled it 10,000 times. Chiaroscuro, 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 thank you. 
Um, you'll see more of her work later in the season with our world premiere that's upcoming of the play Newtown. Anne Lynn Dauber, our costume designer, is a frequent collaborator of Rachel's and whose sumptuous design includes some fun homages to Grace Kelly in the film. And the stage manager, Laura Berrios, joins us from Dallas, as does the wig designer, Nick lynch Boris. They're both amazing. Julia Bregge, assistant stage manager, Fiona Kyle, our dramaturg, and Andrew Mark Wilhelm, the sound designer, are all members of Jiva's full-time staff. Speaking of Jane Eyre, we have Awesta Zarif back with us in a much different role than the mysterious housekeeper Bessie or the haughty suitor Blanche to now play Margo. Evan Zess, who worked at Hartford Stage when both Elizabeth Williamson, our artistic director, and Rachel were there on another murder mystery, Murder on the Orient Express, plays our very capable Inspector Hubbard. Danny Gardner, who frequently treads the boards of Broadway, joins us as Tony, and he brings his musical theater background to Tony's charm and quick-footedness. Rounding out the cast are two actors who are originally from the Dallas area, the incredible Zach Reynolds as Captain Leskett, and the very, very captivating Kia Nicole Boyer as Maxine. Kia is a huge film and murder mystery buff, which was deeply helpful in the rehearsal process. Before I open this up to questions, I want to leave you with a quote by a little-known film director named Martin Scorsese, talking about seeing the film of Dial M in 3D. This, a fun fact is that this movie was actually released in 3D with the glasses, probably not as high-tech as our glasses these days, but it was an experience that people could go see. And he said this um, about that experience, and it reminded us at Jiva a lot about the production you're going to see tonight. Here's the quote. Dial M for Murder went from being a good picture to a great one. The 3D deepened the emotions of the small set. All the distances between people became very charged. It brings the inner world of the characters in their living space very close to the audience. That sounds a lot like the beauty of live theater, doesn't it? So we're excited to see some of those elements come out tonight. All right, does anyone have any questions? We have about four minutes. Yes. Produced first here or uh, This production is produced first here, and then it will go to Dallas in the spring. With the same cast, with the exception there's a different Margo in Dallas. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Does all the set go there? Yeah. The question was, does all of the set go? So with the co-production, along with those financial resources and the cast and the crew, uh, not the crew, but the um, design team, that's all shared. So are the sets and the costumes. Um, I believe the design is going there and a lot of these uh, pieces will go. I'm not sure if the wood itself will be going to Dallas that this was built out of. I can't speak to that. Uh, certain with you know certainty, but um, I know that that is part of how Copro works. And, and when we do uh, co-productions with theaters that are a bit closer, like Frida, which you all saw, uh, hopefully everyone you saw was gorgeous. Um, uh, that was with Pittsburgh Playhouse, and we were able to actually drive there and take a lot of those set pieces back here with us. So sometimes you're able to physically bring the set to the next um, space. Anything else? No question? Tell us what we should ask. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, well, here's a fun fact that I shared with one pro log audience that they thought was very fun um, that you can't tell anyone. Um, so Rachel, the director, had a dog with her through the entire rehearsal process who is just the most lovable creature you've ever met in your entire life. And there's a very small picture of him in the bookcase. <laughs> it's a little Easter egg for those in the cast. So there's a little picture of Tuxedo, was his name, up there as part of the set. And now you'll think about that the entire time. <laughs> Sure. 
Sure. So Oesta Zarif, who's playing um, Margot, has been here. She was in the cast of Jane Eyre last season. That's okay. But otherwise, these four actors are all new to us, and we've absolutely loved working with them, um, and hopefully they're having fun here in Rochester. So came at a wintry time, but um, it is still beautiful. Great. Yes? Yes, so that's why I've been telling people about the dog, because Hitchcock doesn't have a cameo, but Tuxedo has a cameo in the show. In the original film, for those who are familiar, Hitchcock does have a cameo. He's in a portrait, a picture that Tony pulls out. But in this one, um, we, we weren't able to fit Mr. Alfred. Uh, if it had been me, it, the, he, his portrait would be hanging right there, growling at everyone. But um, no Hitchcock cameo that I know of. I don't know. If you look really closely. No getting up on the stage, but if you use your x-ray vision, maybe you'll find one. Yes? Oh, sure. I'm um, an understudy for both Margot and Maxine. So hopefully they don't both get sick. <laughs> I don't want either of them to get sick, but that would be a big hand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I won't go to Dallas. I work at Jeeva full time, um, so I'm here. What was your question? It is, but it, this show is so much fun, and this cast is just absolutely wonderful, so it's just been a blast to get to know the script um, in that way. Uh, and you're all going to have so much fun. It's a great night out. All right, I'm getting the signal that we are all done for tonight. Thank you so much for joining. We do ask that you step back out into the lobby so that our actors can do some final prep. Thank you.